Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Classic Tales, our reading of Little Women. And we are on part 18. And when we last left off, we left a scene, a very touching scene between Joe and Beth as they were both coming to terms with the fact that Beth, due to her illness, was uh, likely to pass away soon. And if you recall, Beth found a very touching poem uh, that Joe had written her, and it gave her some comfort to know that just her presence had been uh, an influence, a positive influence um, in Joe's life. So they had a bit of time to, um, to find that closure between each other. So we'll pick up right where we left off. So the spring days came and went, the sky grew clearer, the earth greener, the flowers were up fairly early, and the birds came back in time to say goodbye to Beth, who, like a tired but trustful child, clung to the hands that had led her all her life, as father and mother guided her tenderly through the valley of the shadow and gave her up to God. Seldom except in books do the dying utter memorable words, see visions, or depart with beatified countenances, and those who have sped many parting souls know that to most the end comes as naturally and simply as sleep. As Beth had hoped, the tide went out easily, and in the dark hour before dawn, on the bosom where she had drawn her first breath, she quietly drew her last, with no farewell but one loving look and one little sigh. With tears and prayers and tender hands, mother and sisters made her ready for the long sleep that pain would never mar again, seeing with grateful eyes the beautiful serenity that soon replaced the pathetic patience that had wrung their hearts so long, and feeling with reverent joy that to their darling death was a benignant angel, not a phantom full of dread. When morning came, for the first time in many months, the fire was out. Joe's place was empty, and the room was very still. But a bird sang blithely on a budding bough close by. The snowdrops blossomed freshly at the window, and the spring sunshine streamed in like a benediction over the placid face upon the pillow, a face so full of painless peace that those who loved it best smiled through their tears and thanked God that Beth was well at last. Chapter 41, Learning to Forget Amy's lecture did Laurie good, though, of course, he did not own it till long afterward. Men seldom do, for when women are the advisers, the lords of creation don't take the advice till they have persuaded themselves that it is just what they intended to do. Then they act upon it, and if it succeeds, they give the weaker vessel half the credit of it. If it fails, they generously give her the whole. Larry went back to his grandfather and was so dutifully devoted for several weeks that the old gentleman declared the climate of Nice had improved him wonderfully, and he had better try it again. There was nothing the young gentleman would have liked better, but elephants could not have dragged him back after the scolding he had received. Pride forbid, and whenever the longing grew very strong, he fortified his resolution by repeating the words that had made the deepest impression, I despise you. Go and do something splendid that will make her love you. Laurie turned the matter over in his mind so often that he soon brought himself to confess that he had been selfish and lazy. But then, when a man has a great sorrow, he should be indulged in all sorts of vagaries till he has lived it down. He felt that his blighted affections were quite dead now, and though he should never cease to be a faithful mourner, there was no occasion to wear his weeds ostentatiously. Joe wouldn't love him, but he might make her respect and admire him by doing something which should prove that a girl's no had not spoiled his life. He had always meant to do something, and Amy's advice was quite unnecessary. He had only been waiting till the aforesaid blighted affections were decently interred. That being done, he felt that he was ready to hide his stricken heart and still toil on. As Goth, when he had a joy or a grief, put it into a song, so Lari resolved to embalm his love, sorrow, and music, and to compose a requiem which should harrow up Joe's soul and melt the heart of every hearer. Therefore, the next time the old gentleman found him getting restless and moody and ordered him off, he went to Vienna, where he had musical friends and fell to work with the firm determination to distinguish himself. But whether the sorrow was too vast to be embodied in music, or music too ethereal to uplift a mortal woe, he soon discovered that the requiem was beyond him just at present. 
It was evident that his mind was not in working order yet, and his ideas needed clarifying, for often in the middle of a plaintive strain, he would find himself humming a dancing tune that vividly recalled the Christmas ball at Nice, especially the stout Frenchman, and put an effectual stop to the tragic composition for the time being. Then he tried an opera, for nothing seemed impossible in the beginning, but here again or unforeseen difficulties beset him. He wanted Joe for his heroine, and called upon his memory to supply him with tender recollections and romantic visions of his love. But memory turned traitor, and if possessed by the perverse spirit of the girl, one would only recall Joe's oddities, faults, and freaks, would only show her in the most unsentimental aspects, beating mats with her head tied up in a bandana, barricading herself with a sofa pillow, or throwing cold water over his passion a la gummage, and an irresistible laugh spoiled the pensive picture he was endeavoring to paint. Joe wouldn't be put into the opera at any price, and he had to give her up with a bless that girl, what a torment she is, and a clutch at his hair as became a distracted composer. When he looked about him for another and a less intractable damsel to immortalize in melody, memory produced one with the most obliging readiness. This phantom wore many faces, but it always had golden hair, was enveloped in a diaphanous cloud, and floated airily before his mind's eye in a pleasing chaos of roses, peacocks, white ponies, and blue ribbons. He did not give the complacent wraith any name, but he took her for his heroine and grew quite fond of her, as he, as well he might, for he gifted her with every gift and grace under the sun and escorted her unscathed through trials which would have annihilated any mortal woman. Thanks to this inspiration, he got on swimmingly for a time, but gradually the work lost its charm and he forgot to compose. While he sat musing, pen in hand, or roamed about the gay city to get some new ideas and refresh his mind, which seemed to be in a somewhat unsettled state that winter. He did not do much, but he thought a great deal and was conscious of a change of some sort going on in spite of himself. It's genius simmering, perhaps. I'll let it simmer and see what comes of it he said, with a secret suspicion all the while, that it wasn't genius, but something far more common. Whatever it was, it simmered to some purpose, for he grew more and more discontented with his desultory life, began to long for some real and earnest work to go at, soul and body, and finally came to the wise conclusion that everyone who loved music was not a composer. Returning from one of Mozart's grand operas splendidly performed at the Royal Theatre, he looked over his own, played a few of the best parts, sat staring at the busts of Mendelssohn, Beethoven, and Bach, who stared benignly back again. Then suddenly he tore up his music sheets one by one, and as the last fluttered out of his hand, he said soberly to himself, she is right. Talent isn't genius, and you can't make it so. That music has taken the vanity out of me as Rome took it out of her, and I won't be a humbug any longer. Now what shall I do? That seemed a hard question to answer, and Laurie began to wish he had to work for his daily bread. Now, if ever, occurred an eligible opportunity for going to the devil, as he once forcibly expressed it, for he had plenty of money and nothing to do, and Satan is proverbially fond of providing employment for full and idle hands. The poor fellow had temptations enough from without and from within, but he withstood them pretty well, for much as he valued liberty, he valued good faith and confidence more, so his promise to his grandfather and his desire to be able to look honestly into the eyes of the women who loved him and say all's well kept him safe and steady. Very likely, some Mrs. Grundy will observe, I don't believe it. Boys will be boys. Young men must sow their wild oats, and women must not expect miracles. I dare say you won't, Mrs. Grundy, but it's true nevertheless. Women work a good many miracles, and I have a persuasion that they may perform even that of raising the standard of manhood by refusing to echo such sayings. Let the boys be boys, the longer the better, and let the young men sow their wild oats if they must. But mothers, sisters, and friends may help to make the crop a small one, and keep many tares from spoiling the harvest by believing and showing that they believe in the possibility of loyalty to the virtues which make men manliest in good women's eyes. If it is a feminine delusion, leave us to enjoy it while we may, for without it half the beauty in the romance of life is lost, and sorrowful forebodings would embitter all our hopes of the brave, tender-hearted little lads who still love their mothers better than themselves and are not ashamed to own it. 
Laurie thought that the task of forgetting his love for Joe would absorb all his powers for years, but to his great surprise, he discovered it grew easier every day. He refused to believe it at first, got angry with himself, and couldn't understand it. But these hearts of ours are curious and contrary things, and time and nature work their will in spite of us. Laurie's heart wouldn't ache. The wound persisted in healing with a rapidity that astonished him, and instead of trying to forget, he found himself trying to remember. He had not foreseen this turn of affairs and was not prepared for it. He was disgusted with himself, surprised at his own fickleness, and full of a queer mixture of disappointment and relief that he could recover from such a tremendous blow so soon. He carefully stirred up the embers of his lost love, but they refused to burst into a blaze. There was only a comfortable glow that warmed and did him good without putting him into a fever, and he was reluctantly obliged to confess that the boyish passion was slowly subsiding into a more tranquil sentiment, very tender, a little sad and resentful still, but that was sure to pass away with time, leaving a brotherly affection which would last unbroken to the end. As the word brotherly passed through his mind in one of his reveries, he smiled and glanced up at the picture of Mozart that was before him. Well, he was a great man, and when he couldn't have one sister, he took the other and was happy. Laurie did not utter the words, but he thought them, and the next instant kissed the little old ring, saying to himself, No, I won't. I haven't forgotten. I never can. I'll try again, if, and if that fails, why then? Leaving his sentence unfinished, he seized pen and paper and wrote to Joe, telling her that he could not settle to anything while there was the least hope of her changing her mind, couldn't she, wouldn't she, and let him come home and be happy? While waiting for an answer, he did nothing, but he did it energetically, for he was in a fever of impatience. It came at last and settled his mind effectually on one point, for Joe decidedly couldn't and wouldn't. She was wrapped up in Beth and never wished to hear the word love again. Then she begged him to be happy with somebody else, but always keep a little corner of his heart for his loving sister, Joe. In a postscript, she desired him not to tell Amy that Beth was worse. She was coming home in the spring, and there was no need of saddening the remainder of her stay. That would be time enough, please God, but Laurie must write to her often and not let her feel lonely, homesick, or anxious. So I will at once, poor little girl. It will be a sad going home for her, I'm afraid. And Laurie opened his desk as if writing to Amy had been the proper conclusion of the sentence left unfinished some weeks before. But he did not write the letter that day, for as he rummaged out his best paper, he came across something which changed his purpose, tumbling about in one part of the desk among bills, passports, and business documents of various kinds were several of Joe's letters, and in another compartment were three notes from Amy, carefully tied up with one of her blue ribbons and sweetly suggestive of the little dead roses put away inside. With a half-repentant, half-amused expression, Laurie gathered up all Joe's letters, smoothed, folded, and put them neatly into a small drawer of the desk, stood a minute turning the ring thoughtfully on his finger, then slowly drew it off, laid it with the letters, locked the drawer, and went out to hear high mass at St. Stephen's, feeling as if there had been a funeral, and though not overwhelmed with affliction, this seemed a more proper way to spend the rest of the day than in writing letters to charming young ladies. The letter went very soon, however, and was promptly answered, for Amy was homesick, and confessed it in the most delightfully confiding manner. The correspondence flourished famously, and letters flew to and fro with unfailing regularity all through the early spring. Laurie sold his busts, made al allumettes of his opera, and went back to Paris, hoping somebody would arrive before long. He wanted desperately to go to Nice, but would not till he was asked, and Amy would not ask him. For just then she was having a little ex she was having little experiences of her own, which made her rather wish to avoid the quizzical eyes of our boy. Fred Vaughn had returned and put the question to which she had once decided to answer yes, thank you, but now she said no, thank you, kindly but steadily, for when the time came, her courage failed her, and she found that something more than money and position was needed to satisfy the new longing that filled her heart so full of tender hopes and fears. The words, Fred is a good fellow, but not at all the man I fancied you would ever like, and Laurie's face, when he uttered them, kept returning to her as pertinaciously as her own did when she said in look, if not in words, I shall marry for money. 
It troubled her to remember that now. She wished she could take it back. It sounded so unwomanly. She didn't want Laurie to think her a heartless, worldly creature. She didn't care to be a queen of society now, half so much as she did to be a lovable woman. She was so glad he didn't hate her for the dreadful things she said, but took them so beautifully and was kinder than ever. His letters were such a comfort, for the home letters were very irregular and not half so satisfactory as his when they did come. It was not only a pleasure, but a duty to answer them, for the poor fellow was forlorn and needed petting, since Joe persisted in being stony-hearted. She ought to have made an effort and tried to love him. It couldn't be very hard. Many people would be proud and glad to have such a dear boy care for them. But Joe never would act like other girls, so there was nothing to do but be very kind and treat him like a brother. If all brothers were treated as well as Lori was at this period, they would be much happier race of beings than they are now. Amy never lectured now. She asked his opinion on, on all subjects. She was interested in everything he did, made charming little presents for him, and sent him two letters a week full of lively gossip, sisterly confidences, and captivating sketches of the lovely scenes about her. As few brothers are complimented by having their letters carried about in their sisters' pockets, read and reread diligently, cried over when short, kissed when long, and treasured carefully, we will not hint that Amy did any of these fond and foolish things. But she certainly did grow a little pale and pensive that spring, lost much of her relish for society, and went out sketching alone a good deal. She never had much to show when she came home, but was studying nature, I dare say, while she sat for hours with her hands folded on the terrace at Belrosa, or absently sketched any fancy that occurred to her. A stalwart knight carved on a tomb, a young man asleep in the grass with his hat over his eyes, or a curly-haired girl in a gorgeous array promenading down a ballroom on the arm of a tall gentleman, both faces being left a blur according to the last fashion in art, which was safe but not altogether satisfactory. Her aunt thought that she regretted her answer to Fred, and finding denials useless and explanations impossible, Amy left her to think what she liked, taking care that Laurie should know that Fred had gone to Egypt. That was all, but he understood it and looked relieved, as he said to himself with a venerable air, I was sure she would think better of it. Poor old fellow, I've been through it all, and I can sympathize. With that, he heaved a great sigh, and then, as if he had discharged his duty to the past, put his feet up on the sofa and enjoyed Amy's letter luxuriously. While these changes were going on abroad, trouble had come at home. But the letter telling that Beth was failing never reached Amy, and when the next found her, the grass was green above her sister. The sad news met her at Veve, for the heat had driven them from Nice in May, and they had traveled slowly to Switzerland by way of Genoa and the Italian lakes. She bore it very well and quietly submitted to the family decree that she should not shorten her visit, for since it was too late to say goodbye to Beth, she had better stay and let absence soften her sorrow. But her heart was very heavy. She longed to be at home, and every day he looked wistfully across the lake, waiting for Laurie to come and comfort her. He did come very soon, for the same mail brought letters to them both, but he was in Germany, and it took some days to reach him. The moment he read it, he packed his knapsack, bade adieu to his fellow pedestrians, and was off to keep his promise, with a heart full of joy and sorrow, hope and suspense. He knew Vevey well, and as soon as the boat touched the little quay, he hurried along the shore to Latour, where the Carols were living en pension. The garçon was in despair that the whole family had gone to take a promenade on the lake, but no, the blonde mademoiselle might be in the chateau garden, if monsieur would give himself the pain of sitting down a flash of time should present her. But Monsieur could not wait even a flash of time, and in the middle of the speech departed to find mademoiselle himself. A pleasant old garden on the borders of the lovely lake, with chestnuts rustling overhead, ivy climbing everywhere, and the black shadow of the tower falling across the sunny water. At one corner of the wide, low wall was a seat, and here off Amy often came to read or work, or console herself with the beauty all about her. She was sitting here that day, leaning her head on her hand, with a homesick heart and heavy eyes, thinking of Beth and wondering why Laurie did not come. She did not hear him cross the courtyard beyond, nor see him pause in the archway that led from the subterranean path into the garden. He stood a minute, looking at her with new eyes, seeing what no, hun no one had ever seen before, the tender side of Amy's character. 
Everything about her mutely suggested love and sorrow, the blotted letters in her lap, the black ribbon that tied up in her hair, the womanly pain and patience in her face, even the little ebony cross at her throat seemed pathetic to Lori, for he had given it to her, and she wore it as her only ornament. If he had any doubts about the reception she would give him, they were set at rest the minute she looked up and saw him, for dropping everything she ran to him, exclaiming in a tone of unmistakable love and longing, "'Oh, Laurie, Laurie, I knew you'd come to me!' I think everything was set and settled then, for as they stood together, quiet, quite silent for a moment, with the dark head bent down protectingly over the light one, Amy felt that no one could comfort and sustain her so well as Laurie, and Laurie decided that Amy was the only woman in the world who could fill Joe's place and make him happy. He did not tell her so, but she was not disappointed, for both felt the truth, were satisfied, and gladly left the rest to silence. In a minute, Amy went back to her place, and while she dried her tears, Laurie gathered up the scattered papers, finding in the sight of sundry well-worn letters and suggestive sketches good omens for the future. As he sat down beside her, Amy felt shy again, and turned rosy red at the recollection of her impulsive greeting. I couldn't help it. I felt so lonely and sad, and was so very glad to see you. It was such a surprise to look up and find you, just as I was beginning to fear you wouldn't come, she said, trying in vain to speak quite naturally. I came the minute I heard. I wish I could say something to comfort you for the loss of dear little Beth, but I can only feel, and... He could not get any further, for he, too, turned bashful all of a sudden, and did not quite know what to say. He longed to lay Amy's head down on his shoulder and tell her to have a good cry, but he did not dare, so took her hand instead and gave it a sympathetic squeeze that was better than words. "'You needn't say anything. This comforts me,' she said softly. "'Beth is well and happy, and I mustn't wish her back, but I dread the going home much as I long to see them all. We won't talk about it now, for it makes me cry, and I want to enjoy you while you stay. You needn't go right back, need you? Not if you want me, dear.' I do, so much. Aunt and Flo are very kind, but you seem like one of the family, and it would be so comfortable to have you for a little while. Amy spoke and looked like, and looked so like a homesick child whose heart was full that Laurie forgot his bashfulness all at once and gave her just what she wanted, the petting she was used to and the cheerful conversation she needed. Poor little soul, you look as if you'd grieved yourself half sick. I'm going to take care of you, so don't cry any more, but come and walk about with me. The wind is too chilly for you to sit still, he said, in the half-caressing, half-commanding way that Amy liked. As he tied on her hat, drew her arm through his, and began to pace up and down the sunny walk under the new-leaved chestnuts. He felt more at ease upon his legs, and Amy found it pleasant to have a strong arm to lean upon, a familiar face to smile at her, and a kind voice to talk delightfully for her alone. The quaint old garden had sheltered many pairs of lovers and seemed expressly made for them, so sunny and secluded was it, with nothing but the tower to overlook them and the wide lake to carry away the echo of their words as it rippled by below. For an hour this new pair walked and talked or rested on the wall, enjoying the sweet influences which gave such a charm to time and place, and when an unromantic dinner bell warned them away, Amy felt as if she left her burden of loneliness and sorrow behind her in the chateau garden. The moment Mrs. Carroll saw the girl's altered face, she was illuminated with a new idea and exclaimed to herself, Now I understand it all. The child has been pining for young Lawrence. Bless my heart, I never thought of such a thing. With praiseworthy discretion, the good lady said nothing and betrayed no sign of enlightenment, but cordially urged Laurie to stay and begged Amy to enjoy his society, for it would do her more good than so much solitude. Amy was a model of docility, and as her aunt was a good deal occupied with Flo, she was left to entertain her friend and did it with more than her usual success. At Nice, Laurie had lounged and Amy had scolded. At Veve, Laurie was never idle, but always walking, riding, boating, or studying in the most energetic manner, while Amy admired everything he did and followed his example as far and as fast as she could. He said the change was owing to the climate, and she did not contradict him, being glad of a like excuse for her own recovered health and spirits. The invigorating air did them both good, and much exercise worked wholesome changes in minds as well as bodies. They seemed to get clearer views of life and duty up there among the everlasting hills. The fresh winds blew away desponding doubts, delusive fancies 
delusive fancies and moody mists. The warm spring sunshine brought all sorts of aspiring ideas, tender hopes, and happy thoughts. The lake seemed to wash away the troubles of the past, and the grand old mountains to look benignly down upon them, saying, Little children, love one another. In spite of the new sorrow, it was a very happy time, so happy that Laurie could not bear to disturb it by a word. It took him a little while to recover from his surprise at the cure of his first, and as he had firmly believed his last and only love, he consoled himself for the seeming disloyalty by the thought that Joe's sister was almost the same as Joe's self, and the conviction that it would have been impossible to love any other woman but Amy so soon and so well. His first wooing had been of the tempestuous order, and he looked back upon it as though a long vista of years with a feeling of compassion blended with regret. He was not ashamed of it, but it put, but put it away as one of the bittersweet experiences of his life for which he could be grateful when the pain was over. His second wooing, he resolved, should be as calm as simple as possible. There was no need of having a scene, hardly any need of telling Amy that he loved her. She knew it without words and had given his, him his answer long ago. It all came about so naturally that no one could complain, and he knew that everybody would be pleased, even Joe. But when our first little passion has been crushed, we are apt to be wary and slow in making a second trial. So Laurie let the days pass, enjoying every hour, and leaving to chance the utterance of the word that would put an end to the first and sweetest parts of his new romance. He had rather imagined that the denouement would take place in the chateau garden by moonlight, and in the most graceful and decorous manner, but it turned out exactly the reverse, for the matter was settled on the lake at noonday in a few blunt words. They had been floating about all morning, from gloomy St. Gingolf to sunny Montreux, with the Alps of Savoy on one side, Mont Saint Bernard, and the Dent du Midi on the other, pretty Veve in the valley, and La Sonne upon the hill beyond, a cloudless blue sky overhead and the bluer lake below, dotted with the picturesque boats that looked like white-winged gulls. They had been talking of Bonnevard as they glided past Chillon and of Rousseau as they looked up at Clarence, where he wrote his Heloise. Neither had read it, but they knew it was a love story, and each privately wondered if it was half as interesting as their own. Amy had been dabbing her hand in the water during the little pause that fell between him, and when she looked up, Laurie was leaning on his oars with an expression in his eyes that made her say hastily, merely for the sake of saying something, "'You must be tired. Rest a little and let me row. It will do me good, for since you came I have been altogether lazy and luxurious.' I'm not tired, but you may take an oar if you like. There's room enough, though I have to sit nearly in the middle, else the boat won't trim, returned Laurie, as if he rather liked the arrangement. Feeling that she had not mended matters much, Amy took the offered third of a seat, shook her hair over her face, and accepted an oar. She rowed as well as she did many other things, and though she used both hands and Laurie but one, the oars kept time and the boat went smoothly through the water. "'How well we pull together, don't we?' said Amy, who objected to silence just then. "'So well that I wish we might always pull in the same boat. "'Will you, Amy?' very tenderly. "'Yes, Slurry, very low.' "'Then they both stopped rowing and unconsciously added a pretty little tableau "'of human love and happiness to the dissolving views reflected in the lake.'" Chapter 42 All Alone it was easy to promise self-abnegation when self was wrapped up in another and heart and soul were purified by a sweet example, but when the helpful voice was silent, the daily lesson over, the beloved presence gone, and nothing remained but loneliness and grief, then Jo found her promise very hard to keep. How could she comfort mother and father when her own heart ached with a ceaseless longing for her sister? How could she make the house cheerful when all its light and warmth and beauty seemed to have deserted it when Beth left the old home for the new, and where in all the world could she find some useful happy work to do that would take the place of the loving service which had been its own reward? She tried in a blind, hopeless way to do her duty, secretly rebelling against it all the while, for it seemed unjust that her few joys should be lessened, her burdens made heavier, and life get harder and harder as she toiled along. 
Some people seemed to get all sunshine and some all shadow. It was not fair, for she tried more than Amy to be good, but never got any reward, only disappointment, trouble, and hard work. Poor Jo. These were dark days to her, for something like despair came over her when she thought of spending all her life in that quiet house, devoted to humdrum cares, a few small pleasures, and the duty that never seemed to grow any easier. I can't do it. I wasn't meant for a life like this, and I know I shall break away and do something desperate if somebody doesn't come and help me, she said to herself, when her first efforts failed and she fell into the moody, miserable state of mind, which often comes when strong wills have to yield to the inevitable. But someone did come and help her, though Joe did not recognize her good angels at once because they wore familiar shapes and used the simple spells best fitted to poor humanity. Often she started up at night, thinking Beth called her, and when the sight of the little empty bed made her cry with the bitter cry of unsubmissive sorrow, Oh, Beth, come back, come back, she did not stretch out her yearning arms in vain. For as quick to hear her sobbing as she had been to hear her sister's faintest whisper, her mother came to comfort her, not with words only, but the patient tenderness that soothes by a touch, tears that were mute reminders of a greater grief than Joe's, and broken whispers more eloquent than prayers, because hopeful resignation went hand in hand with natural sorrow. Sacred moments, when heart talked to heart in the silence of the night, turning affliction into a blessing, which, in, which chastened grief and strengthened love. Feeling this, Joe's burden seemed easier to bear. Duty grew sweeter, and life looked more endurable, seen from the safe shelter of her mother's arms. When aching heart was a little comforted, troubled mind likewise found help, for one day she went to the study and leaned and leaning over, the good gray head lifted to welcome her with a tranquil smile. She said very hum humbly, "'Father, talk to me as you did to Beth. I need it more than she did, for I'm all wrong.' "'My dear, nothing can comfort me like this,' he answered, with a falter in his voice and both arms round her, as if he too needed help and did not fear to ask for it. Then, sitting in Beth's little chair close beside him, Joe told her troubles, the resentful sorrow for her loss, the fruitless efforts that discouraged her, the want of faith that made life look so dark, and all the sad bewilderment which we call despair. She gave him entire confidence, he gave her the help she needed, and both found consolation in the act. For the time had come when they could talk together not only as father and daughter, but as man and woman, able and glad to serve each other with mutual sympathy as well as mutual love. Happy, thoughtful times there in the old study which Joe called the Church of One Member, and from which she came with fresh courage, recovered cheerful, cheer, cheerfulness, in a more submissive spirit. For the parents who had taught one child to meet death without fear were trying now to teach another to accept life without despondency or distrust, and to use its beautiful opportunities with gratitude and power. Other helps had Joe, humble, wholesome duties and delights that would not be denied their part in serving her, and which she slowly learned to see and value. Brooms and dishcloths never could be a distaste as distasteful as they once had been, for Beth had presided over both, and something of her housewifely spirit seemed to linger around the little mop and the old brush never thrown away. As she used them, Jo found herself humming the songs Beth used to hum, imitating Beth's orderly ways, and giving the little touches here and there that kept everything fresh and cozy, which was the first step toward making home happy, though she didn't know it till Hannah said, with an approving squeeze of the hand, "'You thoughtful creature. You're determined we shan't miss that dear lamb if you can help it. We don't say much, but we see it, and the Lord will bless you for it. See if he don't.' As they sat sewing together, Joe discovered how much improved her sister Meg was, how well she could talk, how much she knew about good womanly impulses, thoughts, and feelings, how happy she was in husband and children, and how much they were all doing for each other. "'Marriage is an excellent thing, after all. I wonder if I should blossom out half as well as you have, if I tried it, always perwisin I, sh I could,' said Joe as she constructed a kite for Demi in the topsy-turvy nursery." It's just what you need to bring out the tender womanly half of your nature, Joe. You are like a chestnut burr, prickly outside but silky soft within, and a sweet kernel if one can only get at it. Love will make you show your heart one day, and then the rough burr will fall off. 
Frost opens Chestnut Burr's, ma'am, and it takes a good shake to bring them down. The boys go nutting, and I don't care to be bagged by them, return Job, pasting away at the kite, which no wind that blows would ever carry up, for Daisy had tied herself as on a bob. Meg laughed, for she was glad to see a glimmer of Joe's old spirit, but she felt it her duty to enforce her opinion by every argument in her power, and the sisterly chats were not wasted, especially as two of Meg's most effective arguments were the babies, whom Joe loved tenderly. Grief is the best opener of some hearts, and Joe's was nearly ready for the bag. A little more sunshine to ripen the nut, then not a boy's impatient shake, but a man's hand reach... Uh, reached up to pick it gently from the burr and find the kernel sound and sweet. If she suspected this, she would have shut up tight and been more prickly than ever. Fortunately, she wasn't thinking about herself, so when the time came, down she dropped. Now, if she had been the heroine of a moral storybook, she ought, at this period of her life, to have become quite saintly, renounced the world, and gone about doing good in a mortified bonnet with tracks in her pocket. But, you see, Joe wasn't a heroine, she was only a struggling human girl like hundreds of others, and she just acted out of her nature, being sad, cross, listless, or energetic as the mood suggested. It's highly virtuous to say we'll be good, but we can't do it all at once, and it takes a long pull, a strong pull, and a pull altogether before some of us even get our feet set in the right way. Jo had got so far. She was learning to do her duty, to feel unhappy if she did not, but to do it cheerfully. Ah, uh, that was another thing. She had often said she wanted to do something splendid, no matter how hard, and now she had her wish, for what could be more beautiful than to devote her life to father and mother, trying to make home as happy to them as they had to her? And if difficulties were necessary to increase the splendor of the effort, what could be harder for a restless, ambitious girl than to give up her own hopes, plans, and desires and cheerfully live for others? Providence had taken her at her word. Here was the task, not what she had expected, but better because she because self had no part in it. Now, could she do it? She decided that she would try, and in her first attempt she found the helps I have suggested. Still, another was given her, and she took it, not as a reward, but as a comfort, as Christian took the refreshment afforded by the little arbor where he rested, as he climbed the hill called Difficulty. "'Why don't you write? That always used to make you happy,' said her mother once, when the desponding fit overshadowed Joe. "'I've no heart to write, and if I had, nobody cares for my things. <laughs> we do. Write something for us, and never mind the rest of the world. Try it, dear. I'm sure it would do you good and please us very much.' Don't believe I can, but Joe got out her desk and began to overhaul her half finished manuscripts. An hour afterward, her mother peeped in, and there she was, scratching away with her black pinafore on and an absorbed expression which caused Mrs. March to smile and slip away, well pleased with the success of her suggestion. Joe never knew how it happened, but something got into that story that went straight to the hearts of those who read it, for when her family had laughed and cried over it, her father sent it, much against her will, to one of the popular magazines, and to her utter surprise, it was not only paid for, but others requested. Letters from several persons whose praise was honor followed the appearance of the little story. Newspapers copied it, and strangers as well as friends admired it. For a small thing, it was a great success, and Joe was more astonished than when her novel was commended and condemned all at once. I don't understand it. What can there be in a simple little story like that to make people praise it so, she said, quite bewildered. There's truth in it, Joe. That's the secret. Humor and pathos make it alive, and you have found your style at last. You wrote with no thoughts of fame and money, and you put your heart into it, my daughter. You have had the bitter, now comes the sweet. Do your best and grow as happy as we are in your success. If there is anything good or true in what I write, it isn't mine. I owe it all to you and mother and Beth, said Joe, more touched by her father's words than by any amount of praise from the world. So taught by love and sorrow, Joe wrote her little stories and sent them away to make friends for themselves and her, finding it a very charitable world to such humble wanderers, for they were kindly welcomed and sent home comfortable tokens to their mother, like dutiful children whom good fortune overtakes. 
When Amy and Laurie wrote of their engagement, Mrs. March feared that Joe would find it difficult to rejoice over it, but her fears were soon set at rest, for though Joe looked grave at first, she took it very quietly and was full of hopes and plans for the children before she read the letter twice. It was a sort of written duet, wherein each glorified the other in lover-like fashion, very pleasant to read and satisfactory to think of, for no one had any objection to it. "'You like it, mother?' said Joe, as they laid down the closely written sheets and looked at one another. another. "'Yes, I hoped it would be so ever since Amy wrote that she had refused Fred. I felt sure that something better than what you call the mercenary spirit had come over her, and a hint here and there in her letters made me suspect that love and Laurie would win the day.' How sharp you are, Marmy, and how silent. You never said a word to me. Mothers have need of sharp eyes and discreet tongues when they have girls to manage. I was half afraid to put the idea into your head, lest you should write and congratulate them before the thing was settled. I'm not the scatterbrain I was. You must trust me. I'm sober and sensible enough for anyone's confidant now. So you are, my dear, and I should have made you mine. Only I fancied it might pain you to learn that your Teddy loves someone else. Now, mother, did you really think I could be so silly and selfish after I'd refused his love when it was freshest, if not best? I knew you were sincere then, Joe, but lately I have thought that if he came back and asked again, you might perhaps feel like giving another answer. Forgive me, dear, I can't help seeing that you are very lonely, and sometimes there is a hungry look in your eyes that goes to my heart, so I fancied that your boy might fill the empty space if he tried now. No, mother, it is better as it is, and I'm glad Amy has learned to love him. But you are right in one thing. I am lonely, and perhaps if Teddy had tried again, I might have said yes, not because I love him any more, but because I care more to be loved than when he went away. I'm glad of that, Joe, for it shows that you are getting on. There are plenty to love you, so try to be satisfied with father and mother, sisters and brothers, friends and babies, till the best lover of all comes to give you your reward." Mothers are the best lovers in the world, but I don't mind whispering to Marmy that I'd like to try all kinds. It's very curious, but the more I try to satisfy myself with all sorts of natural affections, the more I seem to want. I'd no idea hearts could take in so many. Mine is so elastic it never seems full now, and I used to be quite contented with my family. I don't understand it. I do, and Mrs. March smiled her wise smile as Joe turned back the leaves to read what Amy said of Laurie. It is so beautiful to be loved as Laurie loves me. He isn't sentimental, doesn't say much about it, but I see and feel it in all he says and does, and it makes me so happy and so humble that I don't seem to be the same girl I was. I never knew how good and generous and tender he was till now, for he lets me read his heart, and I find it full of noble impulses and hopes and purposes, and I'm so proud to know it's mine. He says he feels as if he could make a prosperous voyage now with me aboard as mate and lots of love for ballast. I pray he may and try to be all he believes me, for I love my gallant captain with all my heart and soul and might and never will desert him while God lets us be together. Oh, mother, I never knew how much like heaven this world could be when two people love and live for one another. And that's our cool, reserved, and worldly Amy. Truly, love does work miracles. How very, very happy they must be. And Joe laid the rustling sheets together with a careful hand, as one might shut the covers of a lovely romance which holds the reader fast till the end comes, and he finds himself alone in the work, work a day world again. By and by, Joe roamed away upstairs, for it was rainy and she could not walk. A restless spirit possessed her, and the old feeling came again, not bitter as it was before, but a sorrowful, patient wonder why one sister should have all she asked, the other nothing. It was not true, she knew that and tried to put it away, but the natural craving for affection was strong, and Amy's happiness woke the hungry longing for someone to love with heart and soul and cling to while God let them be together. Up in the garret, where Joe's unquiet wanderings ended, stood four little wooden chests in a row, each marked with its owner's name and each filled with relics of the childhood and girlhood ended now for all. Joe glanced into them, and when she came to her own, leaned her chin on the edge and stared absently at the chaotic collection till a bundle of old exercise books caught her eye. She drew them out, turned them over, and relived that pleasant winter at kind Mrs. Kirk's. 
She had smiled at first, then she looked thoughtful, next sad, and when she came to a little message written in the professor's hands, her lips began to tremble. The book slid out of her lap, and she sat long looking at the friendly words as they took a new meaning and touched a tender spot in her heart. Wait for me, my friend. I may be a little late, but I surely shall come. Oh, if he only would. So kind, so good, so patient with me always, my dear old Fritz. I didn't value him half enough when I had him, but now how I should love to see him, for everyone seems going away from me and I'm all alone. And holding the little paper fast, as if it were a promise yet to be fulfilled, Joe laid her head down on a comfortable rag bag and cried, as if in opposition to the rain pattering on the roof. Was it all self-pity, loneliness, or low spirits? Or was it the waking up of a sentiment which had bided its time as patiently as its inspirer? Who shall say? Chapter 43. Surprises. Joe was alone in the twilight, lying on the old sofa, looking at the fire and thinking. It was her favorite way of spending the hour of dusk. No one disturbed her, and she used to lie there on Beth's little red pillow, planning stories, dreaming dreams, or thinking tender thoughts of the sister who never seemed far away. Her face looked tired, grave, and rather sad, for tomorrow was her birthday, and she was thinking how fast the years went by, how old she was getting, and how little she seemed to have accomplished— almost twenty-five, and nothing to show for it. Joe was mistaken in that. There was a good deal to show, and by and by she saw and was grateful for it. An old maid, that's what I'm to be, a literary spinster with a pen for a spouse and a family of stories for children, and twenty years hence a morsel of fame, perhaps, when, like poor Johnson, I'm old and can't enjoy it, solitary and can't share it, independent and don't need it, well, I needn't be a sour saint nor a selfish sinner, and I dare say old maids are very comfortable when they get used to it, but... And there Joe sighed, as if the prospect was not inviting. It seldom is at first, and thirty seems the end of all things to be to, twin, to five and twenty. But it's not as bad as it looks, and one can get on quite happily if one has something in one's self to fall back upon. At twenty-five, girls begin to talk about being old maids, but secretly resolve that they never will be. At thirty, they say nothing about it, but quietly accept the fact, and, if sensible, console themselves by remembering that they have twenty more useful, happy years in which they may be learning to grow old gracefully. And don't laugh at the spinsters, dear girls, for often very tender, tragic romances are hidden away in the hearts that beat so quietly under the sober gowns, and many silent sacrifices of youth, health, ambition, love itself make the faded faces beautiful in God's sight. Even the sad, sour sisters should be kindly dealt with, because they have missed the sweetest part of life, it for no other reason, if for no other reason." And looking at them with compassion, not contempt, girls in their bloom should remember that they too may miss the blossom time. That rosy cheeks don't last forever, that silver threads will come in the bonny brown hair, and that by and by kindness and respect will be as sweet as love and admiration now. Gentlemen, which means boys, be courteous to the old maids, no matter how poor and plain and prim, for the only chivalry worth having is that which is the readiest to pay deference to the old, protect the feeble, and serve womankind, regardless of rank, age, or color. Just recollect the good aunts who have not only lectured and fussed, but nursed and petted, too often without thanks, the scrapes they have helped you out of, the tips they have given you from their small store, the stitches the patient old fingers have set for you, the steps the willing old feet have taken, and gratefully pay the dear old ladies the little attentions that women love to receive as long as they live. The bright-eyed girls are quick to see such traits, and will like you all the better for them, and if death... Almost the only power that can part mother and son should rob you of yours, you will be sure to find a tender welcome and maternal cherishing from some Aunt Priscilla, who has kept the warmest corner of her lonely old heart for the very best nevy in the world. Joe must have fallen asleep, as I dare say my reader has during this little homily, for suddenly Laurie's ghost seemed to stand before her, a substantial, lifelike ghost leaning over her with the very look he used to wear when he felt a good deal and didn't like to show it, but like Jenny in the ballad, she could not think it he, and lay staring up at him in startled silence till he stooped and kissed her. 
Then she knew him and flew up crying joyfully. Oh, my Teddy, oh, my Teddy! Dear Joe, are you glad to see me then? Glad, my blessed boy, words can't express my gladness. Where's Amy? Your mother has got her down at Meg's. We stopped there, by the way, and there was no getting my wife out of their clutches. Your what? cried Joe, for Laurie uttered those two words with an unconscious pride and satisfaction which betrayed him. Oh, the dickens, now I've done it. And he looked so guilty that Joe was down on him like a flash. You've gone and got married. Yes, please, but I never will again. And he went down upon his knees with a penitent clasping of hands and a face full of mischief, mirth, and triumph. Actually married? Very much so, thank you. Mercy on us. What, a, what dreadful thing will you do next? And Joe fell into her seat with a gasp. A characteristic but not exactly complimentary congratulation, returned Laurie, still in an abject attitude, but beaming with satisfaction. What can you expect when you take one's breath away, creeping in like a burglar and letting cats out of the bags like that? Get up, you ridiculous boy, and tell me all about it. Not a word unless you let me come in my, own place, my old place and promise not to barricade. Joe laughed at that, as she had not done for many a long day, and patted the sofa invitingly, as she said in a cordial tone, "'The old pillow is up garret, and we don't need it now, so come and fess, Teddy.' "'How good it sounds to hear you say Teddy. No one ever calls me that but you.' And Laurie sat down with an air of great content. "'What does Amy call you, my lord?' "'That's like her. Well, you look it.' And Joe's eye plainly betrayed that she found her boy comelier than ever." The pillow was gone, but there was a barricade, nevertheless, a natural one, raised by time, absence, and a change of heart. Both felt it, and for a minute looked at one another as if that invisible barrier cast a little shadow over them. It was gone directly, however, for Laurie said with a vain attempt at dignity, "'Don't I look a married man and the head of a family?' "'Not a bit, and you never will. "'You've grown bigger and bo bonier, but you are the same scapegrace as ever.' "'Now, really, Joe, you ought to treat me with more respect,' began Laurie, who enjoyed it all immensely. "'How can I, when the mere idea of you, married and settled, is so irresistibly funny that I can't keep sober?' answered Joe, smiling all over her face so infectiously that they had another laugh, and then settled down for a good talk, quite in the pleasant old fashion. "'It's no use your going out in the cold to get Amy, for they are all coming up presently. "'I couldn't wait. I wanted to be the one to tell you the grand surprise "'and have first skim, as we used to say, when we squabbled about the cream. "'Of course you did, and spoiled your story by beginning at the wrong end. "'Now start right and tell me how it all happened. I'm pining to know.' "'Well, I did it to please Amy,' began Laurie, with a twinkle that made Joe exclaim. "'Fib number one, Amy did it to please you. "'Go on and tell the truth if you can, sir.' "'Now she's beginning to marmot. "'Isn't it jolly to hear her?' said Laurie to the fire, "'and the fire glowed and sparkled as if it quite agreed. "'It's all the same, you know, she and I being one. "'We planned to come home with the carols a month or more ago, "'but they suddenly changed their minds "'and decided to pass another winter in Paris.' But Grandpa wanted to come home. He went to please me, and I couldn't let him go alone. Neither could I leave Amy. And Mrs. Carroll had got English notions about chaperones and such nonsense and wouldn't let Amy come with us. So I just settled the difficulty by saying, let's be married and then we can do as we like. Of course you did. You always have things to suit you. Not always. And something in Laurie's voice made Joe say hastily, how did you ever get Aunt to agree? It was hard work, but between us, we talked to her we talked her over, for we had heaps of good reasons on our side. There wasn't time to write and ask leave, but you all liked it, had consented to it by and by, and it was only taking time by the fetlock, as my wife says. Aren't we proud of those two words, and don't we like to say them? interrupted Joe, addressing the fire in her turn, and watching with delight the happy light it seemed to kindle in the eyes that had been so tragically gloomy when she saw them last. A trifle, perhaps. She's, su she's such a captivating little woman, I can't help being proud of her. Well, then, uncle and aunt were there to play propriety. We were so absorbed in one another, we were of no mortal use apart, and that charming arrangement would make everything easy all around, so we did it. When, where, and how? asked Joe in a fever of feminine interest and curiosity, for she could not realize it a particle. Six weeks ago, at the American's Consul in Paris. A very quiet wedding, of course, for even in our happiness we didn't forget dear little Beth. Joe put her hand in his as he said that, and Laurie gently smoothed the little red pillow which he remembered well. 
Why didn't you let us know afterward? asked Joe in a quieter tone when they had all sat quiet still a minute. We wanted to surprise you. We thought we were coming directly home at first, but the dear old gentleman, as soon as we were married, found he couldn't be ready for a, a, ready under a month at least, and sent us off to spend our honeymoon wherever we liked. Amy had once called Valrosa a regular honeymoon home, so we went there and were as happy as people are but once in their lives. My faith, wasn't it love among the roses? Laurie seemed to forget Joe for a minute, and Joe was glad of it, for the fact that he told her these things so freely and so naturally assured her that he had quite forgiven and forgotten. She tried to draw away her hand, but as if he guessed the thought that prompted the half-involuntary impulse, Laurie held it fast and said, with the manly gravity she had never seen in him before, "'Joe, dear, I want to say one thing, and then we'll put it by forever.' As I told you in my letter when I wrote that Amy had been so kind to me, I never shall stop loving you, but the love is altered, and I have learned to see that it is better as it is. Amy and you changed places in my heart, that's all. I think it was meant to be so and would have come about naturally if I had waited as you tried to make me, but I never could be patient, and so I got a heartache. I was a boy then, headstrong and violent, and it took a hard lesson to show me my mistake. For it was one, Joe, as you said, and I found it out after making a fool of myself. Upon my word, I was so tumbled up in my mind at one time that I didn't know which I loved best, you or Amy, and tried to love you both alike, but I couldn't. And when I saw her in Switzerland, everything seemed to clear up all at once. You both got into your right places, and I felt sure that it was well off with the old love before it was on with the new, that I could honestly share my heart between Sister Joe and wife Amy and love them dearly. Will you believe it and go back to the happy old times when we first knew one another? I'll believe it with all my heart, but, Teddy, we never can be boy and girl again. The happy old times can't come back, and we mustn't expect it. We are man and woman now, with sober work to do, for playtime is over, and we must give up frolicking. I'm sure you feel this. I see the change in you, and you'll find it in me. I shall miss my boy, but I shall love the man as much and admire him more, because he means to be what I hoped he would be. We can't be little playmates any longer, but we will be brother and sister to love and help another all our lives, won't we, Laurie? He did not say a word, but took the hand she offered him and laid his face down on it for a minute, feeling that out of the grave of a boyish passion there had risen a beautiful, strong friendship to bless them both. Presently, Joe said cheerfully, for she didn't want the coming home to be a sad one, I can't make it true that you children are really married and going to set up housekeeping. <laughs> Why, it seems only yesterday that I was buttoning Amy's pinafore and pulling your hair when you tease. Mercy me, how time does fly. As one of the children is older than yourself, you needn't talk so like a grandma. I flatter myself I'm a gentleman growed, as Pigotti said of David, and... When you see Amy, you'll find her rather a precocious infant, said Laurie, looking amused at her maternal air. You may be a little older in years, but I'm ever so much older in feeling, Teddy. Women always are, and this last year has been such a hard one that I feel forty. Poor Joe, we left you to bear it alone while we went pleasuring. You are older. Here's a line, and there's another. Unless you smile, your eyes look sad, and when I touched the cushion just now, I found a tear on it. You've had a great deal to bear, and had to bear it all alone. What a selfish beast I've been. And Laurie pulled his own hair with a remorseful look. But Joe only turned over the traitorous pillow and answered in a tone which she tried to make more cheerful. No, I had father and mother to help me, and the dear babies to comfort me, and the thought that you and Amy were safe and happy to make the troubles here easier to bear. I am lonely sometimes, but I dare say it's good for me, and... You never shall be again, broke in Laurie, putting his arm around her as if to fence out every human ill. Amy and I can't get on without you, so you must come and teach the children to keep house and go halves and everything just as we used to do, and let us pet you and all be blissfully happy and friendly together. If I shouldn't be in the way, it would be very pleasant. I begin to feel quite young already, for somehow all my troubles seem to fly away when you came. You always were a comfort, Teddy. And Joe leaned her head on his shoulder, just as she did years ago, when Beth lay ill and Laurie told her to hold on to him. He looked down at her, wondering if she remembered the time, and but Joe was smiling to herself, as if in truth her troubles had all vanished at his coming. 
you are still the same, Joe. Dropping tears about one minute and laughing the next. You look a little wicked now. What is it, Grandma? I was wondering how you and Amy get on together. Like angels. Yes, of course, but of course, but which rules? I don't mind telling you that she does now. At least I let her think so. It pleases her, you know. By and by we shall take turns. For marriage, they say, halves one's rights and doubles one's duties. You'll go on as you begin, and Amy will rule you all the days of your life. Well, she does it so imperceptibly that I don't think I shall mind much. She is the sort of woman who knows how to rule well. In fact, I rather like it, for she winds one round her finger as softly and prettily as a skein of silk, and makes you feel as if she was doing you a favor all the while. That ever I should live to see you, a hen-pecked husband, and enjoying it, cried Joe with uplifted hands. It was good to see Laurie square his shoulders and smile with masculine scorn at that insinuation as he replied with his high and mighty air, Amy is too well bred for that, and I am not the sort of man to submit to it. My wife and I respect ourselves and one another too much to ever tyrannize or quarrel. Joe liked that and thought the new dignity very becoming, but the boy seemed changing very fast into the man, and regret mingled with her pleasure. I am sure of that. Amy and you never did quarrel as we used to. She is the sun and I the wind in the fable. The sun managed the man best, you remember. She can blow him up as well as shine on him, laughed Laurie. Such a lecture as I got at Nice. I give you my word, it was a deal worse than any of your scoldings, a regular rouser. I'll tell you all about it sometime. She never will, because after telling me that she despised and was ashamed of me, she lost her heart to the despicable party and married the good-for-nothing. What baseness! Well, if she abuses you, come to me and I'll defend you. I look as if I needed it, don't I? said Laurie, getting up and striking an attitude which suddenly changed from the imposing to the rapturous as Amy's voice was heard calling, Where is she? Where's my dear old Joe? <laughs> All right, that seems like a, a good moment for us to pause. So we will pick up back um, here on Monday at uh, noon Eastern. So I look forward to seeing you all then. And um, what, a, what fun surprises we've encountered <laughs> so far and, and quite a roller coaster of emotions as well. I'm very much looking forward to how our story is going to conclude. And I do believe that we will be finishing our book, uh, the entire book by next week. And then after that, um, I'll be scheduling a live stream presentation or discussion with historian Glenn Kyle, and uh, we'll be talking about the historical context of this book, as well as the life of its author, Louisa May Alcott. So I hope you have a wonderful weekend, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye. Mm -hmm.